Well, good evening. We want to welcome everybody to the online edition of our live stream here this evening. We've got uh, John Welch with us from Indianapolis, Indiana. He had two great lessons this morning. We were live and live streaming this morning, but uh, this evening we're doing a live stream lesson here, and the title of the lesson is Lessons from the Carpenter. We're looking forward to to this lesson. Growing up with Dad, I can tell you he's done a lot of uh, woodworking, and so I'm sure that this lesson has a, a lot of personal references to it, and hopefully not many stories about me um, as well, but we'll see. Uh, but we're glad that you're with us. We want to remind you we're going to be live streaming and in person Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night at 7 o'clock each evening, continuing with this gospel meeting. But um, let's uh, open with a prayer, and then we'll have him speak for us. Will you pray with me? Our God and our Father in heaven, we are so thankful and grateful to be here this evening, so thankful for your love and your mercy and your grace. We're thankful for the safe travel of um, John and Gloria and thankful for the work that he's doing this week among us. Uh, we pray that he'll have a um, ready remembrance of the things that he has studied and prepared. We pray that what he says will be helpful to us and practical for us in our lives. Help us to live out the lessons that we learn from your word and help us to Take them to heart. Help us to be obedient to your word and be convicted by what we hear tonight. And we thank you for this opportunity to study, even though it's not in ideal circumstances, and we pray for those who are affected by those circumstances. We pray for those who are struggling with um, all of the things related to what's going on in our country right now. We pray that you'll be with them and be with us for the remainder of this hour. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I must admit, this is odd. <laughs> it's good to see you here. I appreciate my family being here. We've got a few visitors that happened by, and we're glad that they came and are sitting here. I think we're about as socially distanced as we can get in here tonight, so we're looking forward to talking with you. We're going to talk about, as Josh said, lessons from the carpenter. And uh, we might notice a couple of passages in the process. I want you to look at Mark 6 and verse 3. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended in him. Same sort of thing in Matthew, the 13th chapter, and verse 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Jesus was a carpenter. His father was a carpenter. He had learned the trade. That's what he did. And, you know, I noticed that your theme, apparently, for this year is knowing Jesus. Well, you ought to know. One of the things you ought to know about him is that he was a carpenter, and that is reflected in his life, actually. It's important. I came across this poem at one time about entitled The Carpenter's Son. Entering the world at first breath he cries. Joseph is flooded with joy and tears in his eyes as this precious babe's life is passed in his care. He looks on his face, caressing his soft baby hair. What a wondrous blessing, he says to Mary, his wife. We've been given this child to foster in life. A moment in time to hold in our hearts, alone with our son, before his ministry starts. Instantly their hearts are melted as one, and he whispers his name, Jesus, the carpenter's son. O oh God, my father, please guide all my ways. Help us to raise him, Joseph quietly prays. God said, Joseph the carpenter, teach him to build. Each creation he holds with the love I instill. Help him to see past the cold block of wood to a finished masterpiece and proclaim it as good. Teach him to work with his heart and his hands. For one day this child will build hearts of man. This is why you were chosen to raise my only son. He will build a bridge to humanity when he says it's done. You know... As we introduce this lesson, you need to realize that in antiquity, the artisan class was really usually looked down on by the elite. 
but not in Jewish society. In Jewish society, to work with one's hands was deemed to be a worthy profession. It was essential that a father teach his son a trade. A rabbi taught that whoever does not teach his son a trade, it is as if he brought him up to be a robber. And you know, there's a lot of fathers nowadays that could listen to that particular principle. It's important we teach our children to work. It was common for religious leaders in that time to also have a trade. For instance, Halil is reported to have been a woodcutter. Shammai as a carpenter, both of those leaders of the two major Jewish schools of thought at the time, that is the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You might realize as you think about it that his tools, the tools he would use, this might be interesting to you, the tools available at that time were a lot like those used by craftsmen a century ago. Tools that required an edge were made of iron, although steel was less plentiful and of pretty low quality. Planes, for instance, were available. You can see a block plane here. Some Roman planes had iron soles. Saws were available in the form of a bow saw, referred to by some people as a Jesus saw, and a hand saw. The hand saw was shorter than the ones we use today to compensate for the fact that it had a lower quality steel and had very steep angle teeth, which was really rough to cut. It wasn't a narrow curve. The adze was a very popular tool in antiquity. It had a horizontal blade that could accurate, accurately shape timber with a chopping-like motion. You can see in this picture, a lot of those guys had cuts in their feet and missed a toe or two, but it was a very popular tool. They're all sizes were available in iron. The traditional ads existed with a blade strapped to a handle taken from a tree limb, the small ones, and it was popular for small applications. In addition, you could find iron claw hammers, very similar to the ones we use today. Wood mallets for chisel work were possible, and the chis chisels were of a socketed variety that you'll see much in a woodworking store today. The lathe was highly utilized during the era. You can see one there being used in, in a modern setting. The surviving examples of the woodwork they performed on a lathe will match just about anything done today. There also was uh, their brace and bit apparently were not developed then, but the bow drill You'll see an example there, was very widely used. In this area, the golden age of woodworking, all the major joinery was developed at this time. The mortise and tenon you see below the text there, the dovetail over there on the right, all of that had been developed and was being used. A carpenter at this time was needed to make all items in all aspects of life. He, the framing for roofs of house, of the house, doors and frames, tables, beds, objects for cooking were necessary, turn bowls and cups, there's a bowl, and other utensils. They also needed them for farm work. Things such as yokes and plows were necessary. There's an ox yoke you see there, and there on this thing is a man yoke used to carry those buckets, all of them used at that time. In my workshop, in case Josh remembers, he hasn't been there in long times, so I'm old a grudge, but on the wall of it, I have that ox yoke and I have one of those man yokes on the wall outside. During this period of time, there were major building products, projects going on initiated by Herod the Great and later by his sons. Herod's son Antipas built the capital of Galilee just three, just miles from Nazareth called Sepphoris. Sepphoris, there's a picture, I've tried to draw an arrow to it. Sepphoris, which isn't mentioned in the Bible much, was a Greco-Roman city and would have required the services of many carpenters. A lot of people have speculated Jesus and his father Joseph 
may have worked there. There's Nazareth. You can, Nazareth, you can see that it was very close. And so they would have probably walked over there each day and worked on those projects in Sepphoris. You might notice in Jesus' teaching the many instances where as he worked, as he taught, he had the opportunity to refer back to the many lessons he had learned in his work as a carpenter. For instance, Matthew 7. Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house on a rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not. It was founded upon a rock. But do you suppose that Jesus, in the process of being a carpenter and building houses, had seen somebody build the other kind of house? <laughs> Maybe not him, but somebody else. Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man that built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. But as well, there's several lessons. For instance, in Matthew 21, verse 33, here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husband and went into a far country. Perhaps you don't, are not familiar with this particular parable, but this particular parable was the reason Jesus was killed. It was the last parable he ever gave. It was at the culmination of a day of many parables teaching in the temple, and the Jews left after hearing this. They could not escape the fact that he was talking about them, and they determined to kill him, put him to death. When it came the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husband that they might receive the fruits of it. The husbandman took his servants and beat them, beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first. They did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They'll reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said unto themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. They caught him, cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, will let out his vineyard unto other husband, he sh who shall, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. And Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. You suppose Jesus had built a tower in a vineyard and had seen men who refused to pay their dues? In first Luke 14, there went a great multitude with him. He turned and said to him, If any man come to me and ate not his father and mother and wife and children, brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Do you suppose he built some projects and somebody ran out of money? You probably, as you drive around, have seen two or three of those projects <laughs> where somebody ran out of funds. Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. You know, Jesus makes the statement, in Matthew 11, verse 28, you know, as I mentioned in my workshop, on the wall outside it, I have a plaque that says, My yoke is easy. It's a quotation from Matthew 11. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Jesus, the carpenter, 
undoubtedly was one of the master yoke makers in the area of Nazareth. People would come from miles around for a yoke, hand carved, carefully crafted by Jesus, the son of Joseph. Imagine with me somebody coming with a team of oxen, young team, you start them off very young, by the way. We're gonna talk about that later on this week a little bit as we look at uh, the ox goad some more. You can imagine the man is waiting, maybe under an oak tree or an olive tree until the carpenter's finished. Jesus approaches the animals slowly and gently so as not to spook them. He whispers as he measures them, their height, their width, the distance between the two animals, the size of their shoulders. He works slowly, he works carefully, taking his time until he's satisfied that he knows the animals well, knows where their strengths are and where they might be vulnerable to pressure or too much weight. Jesus tells the man to return in a week's time. When the man returns, Jesus again approaches the oxen slowly and quietly. They've learned in a short time to trust the man who's touching them. They allow him to place the new yoke over their shoulders. He checks carefully for any roughness that might chafe or rub. Removing the yoke, he smooths out the edges. He takes his time. It's essential the yoke fit perfectly. If this team is able to do its work well, and so when he's done, the yoke is an exact fit for this particular team of oxen. As you think about this with me, look with me in Matthew 25. The Lord encourages us to remember the smallest customer. And you know, he had done that too. That's a lesson that we all need to learn. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, and here at the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked and ye clothed me. I was sick and ye visited me. I was in prison and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, or fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? When saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer them. Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it under one of the least of these my brethren, You've done it unto me. You know, sometimes when we have a customer, someone we're dealing with, and he's going to spend a lot of money, whoo, we show that fellow attention and care and kindness. But then when we've got a guy who's only spending a few dollars, maybe a few quarters, we don't pay much attention to him. Jesus encouraged us to remember the smallest customer, just as he would have done when he was working in his shop. But I want you to think about a little bit of broader scope. You know, what sort of work would he do? Well, he'd work on furniture that needed repair. That's what a carpenter does. He repairs things. My wife, <laughs> my mother died this year, and she left us a table, big table. I tried hard to give it away to my children because she's had it a long time. It's a beautiful table. My daughter had said she wanted it, but as time has gone by, she said, Dad, I bought my own table. What am I going to do with that? I can't, I don't have any room for this. Josh didn't want it. His house is full. My other two sons didn't want it. It's old. They didn't want something old. And so my wife wrote a big check out to a man on the east side of Indianapolis and hauled that table over there to him and said, finish this, make it look good. Well, right before we were ready to get in the car and come over here, he called and said, it's done. We'd like it out of the way, please. I don't have that big a shop. And we had to tell him, well, I'll be back late next week, but uh, we'll get it then. So furniture, you repair things. Maybe it's a chair that has a broken leg or a kitchen table's broken. We need that wood repaired. Maybe there a big storm came through and they dropped a 
dropped a tree all across the roof of a house. In the same way, exactly the same way, Jesus was a spiritual carpenter. People brought him their broken lives, and he was able to repair them, just as he does today. In the larger workshop of humanity, men and women were going to be his craft. Individuals broken by despair, loneliness, unforgiveness, the emptiness of unfulfillment, children and innocence ready and willing for the first work of righteousness in their hearts. Persons thrown away by society because they were lepers or lame or pitiful. Jesus was going to work on them. You might think about this as you consider these things. Let's see if I can get this moving. This is L.O. Sanderson. You've, if you've looked in Church of Christ hymnals, you've seen a lot of his songs. My dad, when he was a young man, when I was being conceived, Springfield, Missouri, he was uh, in a quartet that worked with L.O. Sanderson trying out all the tunes to all of his songs. But he says about this particular song, Bring Christ Your Broken Life. He says, I had written the music but not, could not by myself come up with acceptable lyrics. I sent the music to T.O. Chisholm and asked him to see what he thought most appropriate for words. This poem was the result. And you've sung it time and time again. And it's about Jesus the carpenter. Bring Christ your broken life so marred by sin. He will create anew, make whole again. Your empty, wasted years he will restore. And your iniquities remember no more. Bring him your every care, if great or small. Whatever troubles you, bring it all. Bring him the haunting fears, the nameless dread. Thy heart he will relieve and lift up thy head. Blessed Savior of us all, almighty friend, his presence shall be ours until the end. Without him, life would be how dark, how drear. But with him, morning breaks and heaven is near. Well, as he worked on these things, there would be furniture in need of repair. He can take that mess we've made that awful mistake that we've committed. He can begin to repair the damage and allow the healing to start. Matthew, the 12th chapter, speaks of it in a prophecy from the Old Testament. A battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out. The gentleness of Jesus in dealing with people. You know, for instance, you might think about a block of wood. I've I've been so busy lately. If you look in my shop, I got blocks of wood all over it. I got a bunch of logs out front that I'm wanting to stick on my lathe. They've been there for a year and I hadn't got time to get to them. But Jesus would have worked extensive hours at the carpenter's bench, cutting out the refuse of old teachings, chiseling at the edges, the ragged edges of disbelief, hammering at the laws of love, sanding away the rough service of self-righteousness. Self With a heart full of compassion, hands that were gentle but firm, and an eye for, protection, for perfection, Jesus the carpenter worked at building and repairing the family business, learned at the side of his father. As you think about this, how does a carpenter think? Well, he sees a block of wood differently than the way you see wood. Most people would look at a piece of wood and say, whoa, it's got these knots in it. It's got cracks in it. It's got ink on it where they stamped it at the lumber yard. It's bowed a little. I can't use those. But a carpenter doesn't look at wood that way. The carpenter sees the potential in the wood. The carpenter says, I can glue those knots in. Uh, that crack can be fixed, and that warp can be taken out with a jointer or a plane. He sees the potential. 
not the problems in the wood. For instance, barn siding is a very popular thing these days. We look at barn siding, my goodness, and say, that's worthless. Might as well throw it in the fire, but carpenters don't see it that way. It's used for a lot of decorative purposes and various other things. In fact, it's in short supply. If we look at it and say there's no potential there, a carpenter says, I think I can use that. He goes out behind a factory and there's some old wooden crates there that are about to be thrown away. The carpenter's standing there looking at that thinking, I wonder all the things I can make out of the wood that's in those crates. Jesus did the same thing. Jesus looks at us today the same way. Does he see all the flaws that will doom us eternally? That's how we look at people. We see all their imperfections. We remember the worst day of their lives, and that's the only thing we really remember about them. Christ sees their potential. Christ looked at a man who was a fisherman. You know, I, I preached a funeral two or three years ago for a fellow that had worshiped with us. He had been a preacher and he had disgraced himself terribly. His wife had left him justifiably. His children hardly talked to him. They'd grown up without him. But he'd come back to the Lord. And at his funeral, I said, wouldn't it be a terrible thing for each of us if the only thing we remembered about somebody was the worst day in their lives, the worst time, instead of looking at him the way Jesus looked at him and could see the potential. Christ sees our potential. He could look at a man who was a fisherman by the name of Simon and say, you're Simon, the son of John, you will be called Cephas, which is translated, of course, means Peter or rock. Can you imagine what Peter's friends must have said on that occasion? Christ saw his potential. Christ said, I'm going to rename him the rock. You'll be a rock in my kingdom. They must have laughed and laughed at Peter. You mean he's going to be a rock in your kingdom someday? you got to be kidding. The guy's just a braggart. You remember all the goofy things Peter said. He's nothing but a show-off. He's never going to amount to anything. A carpenter sees the potential in the wood, not the flaws and imperfections. So the great carpenter is working on us today. He knows the tools to use on us to bring out our potential. He knows maybe when we need to be sanded down a little bit. He carries that out. He knows when maybe we need to be polished. And he carries that out. He knows when various other things need to be done in our lives to bring out the talents that we have. And he carries those things out if we allow him to do it. He sees our potential. And he works on that. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 and verse 10, we are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are God's workmanship. You are not a random, where's the camera here? You are not a random assembly of molecules. You're a handmade, one-of-a-kind masterpiece creation of the Almighty God. You may not have been treated like you were valuable, just like you might throw away a board. But that's what you really are. And your creator, the one who made you in the first place, says so. We are God's workmanship. Now, when, you, when, when Jesus looks at you, it's like a carpenter looking at that, that empty room. He sees that room could with skilled hands be finished, renewing it. He knows the masterpiece you were created to become, the difference you're created to make, the value you really have. He ha you have so much value in you that he was willing to give his life's blood for you. You don't think so? Other people may not think so, but he thought so. 
A lot of other people only see the bare room. Maybe you've been made to feel pretty worthless, incompetent, unloved, unworthy. But in fact, Jesus loves you. They don't see what he sees, what you were born to be. The carpenter is still at work today, working on me. Out of this world's misery, he took me and brought me to a worn workbench of his righteousness and with love worked on me. When I've been exposed to outside forces that have worn me down and broken my spirit, sucked up my usefulness, the carpenter held me, examined me, and with the eyes of a creator spoke to me of a new life, new meaning. The repairs began. He took the tools of love, peace, and joy and created in me obedience, commit contentment, and a renewed purpose in life. It didn't happen overnight. In fact, it's still going on. At times I've cried out, not because I wanted him to stop, because I didn't like feeling so vulnerable, so pliable in his hands. At times I failed him, and he had to start over again. We all carry those scars. But those scars, too, are being smoothed out and sanded into something marvelous. My own distinguishing mark. The craftsman knew uh, my weaknesses and made me strong. He knew my blemishes. He made me beautiful. He knew my strengths. He made me purposeful, dusty, blistered, calloused hands, and an aching back. That's what's true of a carpenter's life. Blood-soaked, pierced hands and feet, and a broken heart. Those are the hazard of the carpenter's life. Neither one sounds really that enticing to me. But as the, the rewards, as immense as the Creator looks upon us, His life's passion, that's you and me, created with care. You know, the strange thing is that a workman can be without honor. In Mark 6, he went from out from thence and came to his own country, and his disciples follow him. When the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon, are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. He was just a carpenter. How does he come by thinking so much of himself? But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went around about the villages teaching. You need to realize God respects all honorable work. You and I need to do the same thing too. The fact that he was a carpenter for about 15 years emphasizes the fact that God respects honorable work that we might do, even manual labor. The manual labor a carpenter would have been involved in. That was a hard lesson for the Jews to learn. Do you realize that? Jesus didn't meet their concept of being the Messiah because he'd been a carpenter from a probably his teen years on up. They expected the Messiah to be born in a palace. He wasn't. He was born in a stable. They expected Jesus to be born into a royal family. He wasn't. He was born by the Virgin Mary with his father, Joseph. They expected him to be raised and to be taught military skills. What they really thought was the Messiah would be trained as a soldier. Ultimately, he would raise an army. He would be the general of that army. And based on military power, he would run the Romans out of Judea. <coughs> he would then become a king and establish the Jewish nation in Palestine. That was the Jewish view of the Messiah in the early first century. But it didn't happen that way. He wasn't born in a palace to a royal family. He wasn't trained as a soldier or a military leader. He was trained to be a carpenter, 
Why? He wanted to identify himself with common people, ordinary folks. He wanted to identify himself with the dignity of manual labor. He wanted us to understand that as long as it is honest work that we're engaged in, then any job is respectable in the eyes of God. I've seen people who would look down on their children because they did honorable work, but it was menial work. Is that all you're doing is flipping burgers? What's wrong with flipping burgers? It's honest. You're working. There's a lot of people who aren't doing anything. That's not the way the pe people of Nazareth saw a carpenter. They were prejudiced, saying, is not this the carpenter? There's a tombstone in Great Britain, and on the tombstone there's an epitaph. The man's name was Thomas Cobb, and it says, Here lies Thomas Cobb, who mended shoes to the glory of God for 40 years. Are you able to do that in your work? Honor God in what you do as God works on you just the way you're working on whatever you're working on. You know, you might also consider Johann Sebastian Bach. Do you realize that on every piece of music he wrote, he put the letters SDG, Solo Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Whether it's manual labor, whether it's mental, whether involved in some profession, we can glorify God with the kind of work we do. And Jesus wanted folks to realize that sort of thing in his life. You know, the Lord Jesus could have chosen to die in a number of ways. He could have chosen to be beheaded as John the Baptist was. Could have chosen to be stoned to death as they were under the law of Moses. He could have been chosen to be shot to death as was Ahab back in the book of Kings. Remember that fellow who let go of an arrow at a chance and happened to hit him? Instead, he chose to die a carpenter's death. The Roman soldiers took a hammer and nails the tools of a carpenter, they nailed the Son of God to a wooden cross. It was an ugly way to die, but it was fitting for the great carpenter. Why did he do that? He went through that to buy us from Satan. His blood would result in our forgiveness of sin if we'd accept it. When we were forgiven of our sins, then we could be transferred from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of light, the Lord's church. So when he died on a wooden cross, it was to bring about our redemption of sins. It was a fitting way for a carpenter to depart. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, if you're listening, watching tonight and are not a Christian, you need to be one. Most of you have Josh's number or the church number. If you'll call him, he'll be glad to help you, teach you, to work just like the carpenter, to revise your life, to point you in the right direction, to use the tools that God has given us to alter our lives. I wish I could say come while we stand and sing, but there's nobody here and we're not singing. But we invite you to come. Would you pray?